Uh, today I will be taking you on a personal log where knowing it has gone before, uh, which will be an exploration which I've recently done on the C++ fringe, a place where I really enjoy spending at least some of my time. And where the uncalled for happens anyway, or in our case, where uncalled code happens anyway. I'll give you a few seconds to take this in. You see it? Okay, let's go on. So, <clears throat> first of all, a short disclaimer. This is a talk about logging, but it's not quite a talk about logging. I'm not interested in how, which actual log you use, how do you do your uh, file I.O., if it is at all file I.O. or anything else. I'm also, for the sake of simplicity, I will be showing only logs that display simple strings. I won't be dealing with log parameters, which are obviously part of actual production code. So basically, I'm dealing with in a very simple log payload and um, a novel way in which I'm uh, obfuscating it and managing later to uh, decode it back. Also, since there were some doubts uh, raised about this, I make it clear from the get-go, I am using no pre-processing. There is macro code, sorry for that, that probably makes me evil. But other than the built-in preprocessor, there is no other preprocessing here. And this is all being done in C17. And yes, next time we'll ask for a longer slot perhaps and show you parameter handling and uh, who knows what. So what I will be showing you is, first of all, the encoding part, which is uh, quite uh, easy. Then, uh, the implementation of Duon in it, and its usage for building a decoder tool. First of all, a short introduction. My name is Andrei Zisu, first time uh, speaking anywhere other than in uh, C++ core in Tel Aviv last year, uh, last week rather, first time in the US too. I'm an Israeli programmer, C++ obviously. Uh, I've been in multiple industries, mobile, cyber, multimedia, several others. Since the start of this year, I'm a member of the Israeli national body, and I hope to start pursuing soon my interest in reflection. I've been working at a uh, startup called Binai AI, uh, which um, develops a remote telemedicine uh, technology. It's an app which I have on my phone. Within 90 minutes, you can take your vital signs. Uh, it works on Windows, uh, Android, several other platforms. Uh, and it has an SDK which can be easily integrated with uh, third parties. So let's start at the beginning, which must have been about six months ago. So I was tasked with this, I'm lying, not simple task, of removing uh, log strings from shipped binaries. So let's say this is your production code. I hope not, and you are doing some password checks, license checks, whatever, and you'd rather not make life too easy for hackers by having logs which, whose strings can be easily detected in the binary, as in here's where I'm doing my license check or here's where I'm doing my password check. So we'd rather be rid of those strings. And I had to work with C17, which makes things a little bit harder than it would have been with 20. On the other hand, as it turns out, it would have been impossible in C14. So obviously, the task here is to replace those strings with something else. What could that something else be? First thing coming to mind would be encrypted strings. Now, this perhaps might be possible, it wouldn't be easy, definitely not in C17, and it would be pro uh, probably look quite awkward and hard to maintain. 
So we'd rather be considering some numeric representation. The first thing coming to mind, which is pretty common in the industry, I believe, is to have a long, long, long enum with one entry per each log. And therefore, you get a kind of a manual uh, mapping between uh, your uh, code, your log uh, number and its uh, respective text. Uh, such a thing obviously requires a big upfront effort and lots of maintenance later on whenever you either add or modify log messages. And I don't know about you, but I uh, like to think of myself as human and I'm probably going to be making a lot of mistakes along the way. So we need to think about some kind of automation. Uh, and the thing coming to mind is hashing uh, those string uh, texts. Hashing does have some advantages. First of all, a hash would be of constant size, which is good both for uh, the binary size as well as for security, since there's no correlation between the hash size and the size of the uh, actual string. And it's easy, took me probably about five minutes to find a uh, function online uh, to do this kind of um, const expert uh, hashing and which would be compatible with C++ 17. Its drawbacks uh, are twofold. One of them, hashing, can't be reversed uh, straight away. It's a one-way function. And secondly, we do have hash collisions. Now, with a good hash function, hash collisions are highly un unlikely. In those six months, I've yet to encounter one. And how do I know that? Which goes to the mitigation part. My solution, guarantees that I'll find any hash collision straight away and I can just replace my hash key, rather my seed. Uh, so let's go on with it. First of all, this is a function I found online. There's not much to talk about it, not much that I really understand about it. The important things to note is that its input is a string value of some kind uh, it will have to be compatible with uh, compile time strings. Uh, you can add a second parameter to be able to configure the uh, seed for the hashing. And uh, it returns a size t, which is our 64-bit, if this is a 64-bit process. So it is our 64-bit uh, hash. I've tweaked it just a little bit, and you will notice on the last line uh, that I've wrapped it in my uh, log macro. And now the log macro, rather than just outputting the message to see out, is hashing it first and outputting the result. And we can see straight away that uh, two uh, hash values are being output. So cool, we are almost there. Just one little more thing to check. Have we actually gotten rid of those bad uh, hacker-friendly strings? Nope, not yet. As I'm sure you'll remember, const expert means that this may run at compile time, but may also run at runtime. So we need to force it to run at compile time. And this is still pretty easy. You'll notice I've, add, I've added a second line, the first one here. I'm using the standard integral constant uh, facility. Since the expression is being used as a uh, non-type uh, template parameter, uh, it's forcing the compiler's hand and now it will have to evaluate it at compile time. So, mission accomplished. Parcel is gone, no re you can see it wasn't found, no results. And we got log of the log strings. Thank you very much for coming here, we're all done, just kidding. Problem is we just got rid of those log strings and we might just want to be able to read those logs. So how do we get them back? <clears throat> so, one nice thing I wanted to tell you, but also about my uh, appreciation to community spirit, once I was at this point, I had been 
doing the first part for probably about a day, and I knew I would have to face this hurdle. I was quite prepared failing this to go ahead and write some preprocessor. I gave myself one day to do this, and I just made it with the help of uh, the Israeli C++ WhatsApp uh, group, which I communicated with throughout the day. I love brainstorming. <laughs> and all of the following happened in that one magic Thursday, probably back in March. Uh, so here are our decoding hurdles. We don't have the original strings. Hash functions are one way only. Therefore, production code the one doing the encoding uh, can't reverse the process can, and can't prepare an offline dictionary as is often the case in such cases. Therefore, we will need to do this in a separate decoding tool, a separate executable, which will be the one um, performing the decoding. Uh, lucky for us, I didn't tell you quite the whole truth. We don't have those uh, strings anymore except, of course, in the actual source code. So, let's assume the decoder could somehow get to those original strings. What would it, would, would it do with them? It could calculate their hashes again, bearing in mind const expr, as I just said, can also run at runtime. Now the question becomes, where can it get those uh, strings from? We do have all those strings used in logger macro invocations. But that's all over the place in locations which are not being invoked in the decoder. Now, just to make it clear, the decoder has the actual source files in its process, so it has access to the entire source code, otherwise this wouldn't work. But it's not calling those functions, no one is. And we're going to be able to somehow collect all of them, and I just promised you no preprocessor. So what would we need to be able to do this? <clears throat> we need to be able to collect all the strings from uninvoked locations before anything else happens, meaning before we start parsing log files in the decoder tool. How can we do this? So, in general, if I were to tell you, let's go do something automatically in C++, the only one way I believe is through some kind of constructor. A constructor of what? The main thing coming to mind would be a global object. But that's an immediate no-no, because we need to, do, to be able to do this from local scopes. So the other thing is static data members of classes. And luckily, we do have those in our language. In most cases, we call them lambdas. Uh, but as you know, lambda is just syntactic sugar, so we can actually use them in their original form. So let's try it. Looks pretty easy. We have our original function. I've defined a local class with a nested class. Its constructor some, does something that I'd really like it to do. And I'm uh, hold, storing a nested instance of that uh, internal class. Will this work? What do you think? Nope. First thing I didn't know back in March, the language doesn't support static data members in local classes. So we need to find another way. So now we're gonna take the local class and turn it into a template class which is not local. We're just going to instantiate it locally. And we've managed to build it. Now I ask you again, will this work? Come on, I'm not calling that function. How do you, do you expect this to work? I mean, we have the optimizer. So how do we force the optimizer's hand? Obviously, we need to be looking for something that cannot be optimized away. The first try was to use a template uh, instantiation, but it's an unused instantiation, so the optimizer just dumped it. 
So that was a side effect. It seems not to be working, but pay attention to one little detail. This is now a linker error, so we've passed the compilation stage. Now this is quite commonplace. We just need to provide a, oh, I always miss those up, it's either a definition or a declaration. And now the linker will also be happy. And this works. So for the first time, we have a piece of uninvoked code, which is actually being executed. Any questions so far? Cool. So now we don't really want to keep uh, printing to C out, so we're gonna uh, try to still maintain an ODR use without having an, any actual side effect. This is the uh, most trivial way of doing it, and this still works. So, I hope you still managed to see this, cool. So just a uh, quick recap. So for now, we have a template class with a nested class of which it's holding a, a static data member. The template class is being instantiated in a local context with a template parameter which is dictated by the local context and it's being able to execute a piece of uninvoked code in this manner. So we've made small progress but as you can see we've We've managed to pass along a small piece of state, the line number, but we would really want to be able to um, carry out any piece of state to be able to execute any action. And the way in C++ we usually call custom actions is a word I've just used a few minutes ago, which is lambdas. So instead of the line, uh, the line number, we would really want to instantiate our template with the actual lambda. We could consider other options, but they are no-goes. I mean, usually when you're, you need to pass some, let's call it predicate to a template, you're gonna pass it as a uh, function parameter, perhaps a constructor parameter. In our case, we, have, we need to be able to construct a static data member which can only be default constructed, so no parameters. It can only be a template parameter, same, same as we previously passed the line number, and it would be a, uh, a non-type template parameter. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the first actual not yet non-type template parameter. This is the first naive um, attempt to do this. I just took the lambda, tried to instantiate the template with it. In the template on line eight, I'm trying to instantiate the predicate and call it, and obviously this doesn't work. Doesn't compile, rather. So, no go. At this point, I was almost stuck, and as always, I went onto the internet, and I found this solution. So let's break this down. First of all, I have a prototype of a void void function, which I'm using as non-type template parameter. Now this is very important. I have a function pointer of the same uh, prototype, and it's const expr. By being const expr, it can be used as NTTP. This is the only way this works. And then you can see on line 23 that I'm uh, now uh, instantiating the template with this uh, pointer. And now we have the whole pieces in place. So we have custom code executed at global init from non-invoked context in C++ 17. We'll talk about the third bullet soon. There are issues, especially with, this, with uh, GCC. Now we have a small packaging step. 
not much novelty about this this step. I've just wrapped the two uh, lines you previously saw inside a function. Now it's a macro. Is this clear? Okay. So now, this is this was one of my first slides. You now know how this works. And. This was not done by me, but as you can see, it's even smaller in C++ 20. I mean, if it's just about 20 lines of code with some spaces in uh, C++ 17, in 20 it's gonna be five or six, more or less. And uh, since 20 is apparent, apparently is able to use the lambda type as a regular template parameter rather than NTTP and is then able to instantiate it. Now a word about this inline static that was used here. This is actually available in C++17. You can go ahead and use it if it works for you. I was forced to take a step back since for some unknown reason, I did promise you an hour on the fringe. When I used this in Visual Studio 2019, Sometime during uh, execution, I got a crash. No idea why, took the step back, all is fine. Questions? Yes? Uh, I haven't thought about that, neither seemingly have my commenters. Having said that, this is just, this goes with all the other considerations that I have come up with for refraining from na for now from using this in production code. You will notice I am not doing this in production code, the decoding tool is not production code. But it's probably a good point. <clears throat> Okay, so let's put this all together. We started off encoding our log strings at compile time. And now we need to build the decoder tool. Um, production code doesn't have the original strings, but we do have them in source code, which the decoder tool is able to use. So decoder, the decoder tool sees the same log macros but can provide a different implementation for those macros. What would that implementation do? We would be creating a mapping of our hashes back to the original strings. And we would be doing this before, before or all else, meaning before we start to parse uh, the log files. And of course, we will use do on init in order to do this. So let's go to our overall design. <clears throat> uh, I've defined a single compile time flag. In actual code, I'm using two flags with three states so that I also have a neither of state. In this demo, there is no neither of state. So I call this flag build for encoding. If it's on, it does the uh, uh, log text substitution that you, you've just seen. If it's off, we're going to be using do on init to register the log strings. Uh, and during parsing, we will be replacing an encountered hash with uh, the corresponding uh, or the original string. And as previously mentioned, I won't be talking about file IO or log parameters. So let's start. Uh, <clears throat> this is the uh, top part. We've seen the uh, encoding part, and we're gonna delve down into the decoding part. We can see here that we are using do on init, and the code that it's uh, required to uh, carry out is a call to a function called register message which is being handled our log message. 
So we have on the first line uh, our global map, which is mapping a size t, which would be our hash values, back to the original strings. And we can afford our value type to be a const char pointer, since uh, those log strings are basically hard-coded strings. Uh, <clears throat> now we need to access this map in a lazy manner so uh, that it would be immune to the global uh, initialization uh, fiasco. This uh, is our safety net. In case there is ever any hash collisions, it will come up here. Uh, obviously only in uh, debug uh, builds, but uh, this should be good enough. Uh, so first of all, we are checking for any recurrence of any hash key, which might happen if there is any attempt made to register the same uh, log string twice, but then we would expect it to be the same log strings. So we're first trying to ascertain that in a cheap uh, manner, which should by just comparing pointers, that should suffice uh, in case uh, we have a string pooling in the compiler. Otherwise, we do a full string comparison. And now we can test this. As you can see, I've placed two uh, hash values in the demo. Where did I take them from? I first ran my code with the build for encoding. So it produced the two uh, hash values. And now I've commented out this line. And as you can see, we have our original strings back. And you can see here what it is actually happening in this case is that F is not being called. F is the one that contains those strings. And then, and yet we are able to produce them on, um, out of their hashes. Okay. And now let, let's look at some nice call stacks. This is, this is Visual Studio. I've placed a breakpoint in the registration function. Now, first thing, you can notice here that we are in a global init context. You can see it somewhere there, the dynamic initializer. Okay, and we can explore this uh, stack trace and find some more useful info. First of all, here in the first place, you can see the, the log string that it's in the process of being registered, right? And if we go up the call stack, we can see where this log entry is located. And just, just if, you, uh, if this somewhat confuses you, no, I didn't lie, F is still not being called. We are not inside F here. We are inside a lambda produced by the log macro. Next up, we have uh, our nested class constructor. And here we have basically our global object created uh, out of the uh, definition. Any questions? Okay. So, let's do a short demo. Okay, so here we have one Visual Studio solution. The lower portion which I'm gonna run now is the production code. Uh, if you want, I can go over the code quickly, but in general, sorry? Okay, yeah, I know, but you know, it's several files. Oh, oh, oh. oh. I'm not sure how this should work with uh, two screens. Let's, let's try this way. Cool. There. 
Cool, cool. Thanks for that. Okay. So this is the production code. This is the one that shouldn't contain any undefined behavior or uh, any of that stuff you asked about. And it shouldn't because it's not really doing anything complicated. It just invokes a const x per hash function. So we have a main file. We have some production code, SRCCPP. We have our logger. Um, as I said, I'm not really going into this, but what I do want you to see. So I've just run it. Just note the production code includes those two uh, functions, which are being called in this case from main. And we have produced an encoded log, which looks like this. Okay, I'm sure this looks familiar by now. Now, I'm gonna go to the decoder. Let's run it. Oh, this is so embarrassing. It's failed to, for some reason, it's failed to decode our hashes. Oh, but wait a minute. So let's take our actual production code and include it in the decoder process. Now let's do this again. Let's have a look. Ta-da! Okay, so basically, you can drop in here any of your um, production source files, which are going to produce those codes. And once you've done that, the decoder tool will be familiarized with their hashes and will be able to decode them. You will have a slight problem if you also need to decode uh, logs from your uh, main CPP, because obviously we can't have two main functions. But if that is really important, I'm sure uh, ways can be found around that. <coughs> so now let's get back. Cool. So now, once we've seen this, uh, this whole development did require a set of quite special circumstances. First of all, the need itself, I believe, was a bit unique, as in normally you may be re uh, required to protect your logs in some way. Usually, you would need to protect your log files, and this might not be the best option for it. You would encode them or whatever. The need to get rid of logged strings is a bit more unique. And it, as I said, it's probably usually handled through uh, ugly enums. Ah, sorry. Now, I didn't know this hack was, had just become possible in C17. Now, the reason for that is that if you try this in 14, you, uh, you cannot compile the assignment of the lambda into the const expert function pointer. If you think about it, this is quite ridiculous. I mean, obviously, Lambda itself contains non const per code, but why should you care about that? It's just a pointer to the Lambda. Uh, so this did become possible in C17. One more thing I luckily didn't know, as in the, this whole thing shouldn't have been possible, uh, was the thing about locally defined classes which can't have static data members. And since, as it turned out, I would have had issues with both GCC and uh, CLang, it's a good thing that I happen to be working with uh, Visual Studio. So let's talk about GCC. GCC can swallow this code. 
In a minute, I will go into the why of this. Now, if you are crazy enough, and I might have been, but not crazy like this guy, remember the name, you'll see him again in a couple of slides. This, this guy came to the Israeli meetup where I showed this presentation last month. And I told them GCC doesn't work, and a day or two later, he sent me this code. Now you will, will probably need a minute or two on this. I mean, this is crazy. He used the template not as NTTP. He actually did pass the uh, Lambda type in a manner. The one thing that in this case is not normally possible is to instantiate the Lambda inside the template. So what this guy did, he didn't instantiate it. He just took the number one, you can pick any number, and the forcefully cast a lambda pointer onto this and then invoked it. And this is one way to get GCC to, uh, to, to uh, implement the one in it. Now about GCC, it turns out there's a open bug, I think it's about four years old. Uh, I'd be happy to know if there's any GCC implementer in the crowd. Uh, as it turns out, as it was explained by Joshua Lee on uh, Stack Overflow, uh, GCC is perfectly happy with instantiated a template with a const expr, as long as that uh, function pointer is derived from a free function and not for a lambda. I mean, this is obviously wrong. It's okay if you, uh, if you mean stateful lambdas, but I'm using a stateless one, which should be in always equivalent uh, with a free function. Now, thanks to um, one of our guys here in the crowd, I think, Erez Strauss, I was having a chat with him the other day, and he sent me a piece of his code, and this way I discovered that GCC has a non-standard mechanism in an attribute called init array, which basically does what do on init does. So probably you can just do that, use that on GCC. Oh, and, uh, and about this init array, as I understand, this might be something that has to do with the executable format on Linux platforms, so I'm not sure this will work, for example, on Windows. Now about CLang, for quite a while, basically until last month, I was blaming CLang for doing stupid things without realizing I was a stupid one. So at some point I realized one of my early stages of the demo was crashing with a seg fault. And I couldn't figure out why. And this Alexander guy, this is the second time, uh, again pointed out a day or two after the meetup that I shouldn't have been using C out when coupled off the, in, with the one in it. This is again the static initialization fiasco, and as it happens, C out is an object. And actually, and I wasn't able to reproduce that, at one point I switched some include order in my demo code in Visual Studio and got the same thing. So if you're looking for undefined behavior, it's this, but it's not do on in it, it's what I'm doing with it. And it's easy to fix, just use printf. So let's recap this. First, firstly, I'm getting rid of the original log messages by invoking a const expr hash function. And then we have the do one init implementation, which is done by using a class template templated on a const expr function pointer passed in as non-template type parameter. The non-template type parameter function, or lambda, is executed in a constructor of a nested class. The nested class is invoked during the uh, construction, the global runtime construction of a static instance in the outer class of the nested class. 
and the outer template class is instantiated with the desired local lambda as NTTP via a function pointer which must be const expr. And we are forcing an ODR use to quiet down the optimizer by casting to void. And the do on init uh, utility is being used in the decoder tool to create a mapping of, uh, of uh, the log text hash values back to the original text. Now, a quick analysis of this. We have several drawbacks. First of all, as I've said, this seems a little shady right now for production code. It might change later on. Um, now, I haven't changed uh, all compiler. I, I haven't checked all compilers. I, the big three I did check, and uh, you uh, saw the problems with GCC. Silang doesn't actually have any problem as I had originally thought. As to undefined behavior, if any of you can point one out, I haven't found one yet. However, for internal tools, if you can aff afford those risks there, this can be great, as, an, as in this case, this could be a great companion for a production code without actually being used in production code. Secondary drawback is that it makes me an evil person. Sorry about that. <clears throat> And you saw what happened with C out. That's the third uh, drawback that it also makes me a stupid person. Now as to performance. <clears throat> um, I haven't seen any serious uh, performance uh, hit here. Now we're talking about both things, the const expert part and the decoder part. The production code may actually benefit here. We replace uh, strings with hash values, which on average are likely to be smaller than the original strings. The decoder tool, which was already doing some things, so could somehow appreciate uh, the, the impact here. Uh, just a small caveat, I'm, I'm not sure if 200 plus logs would be a lot of logs, but having said that, I have, uh, the, the decoder tool is blazingly fast, I haven't seen any uh, slowness there uh, in terms of the time it takes to initialize the uh, global dictionary. As to production code, as I said, hash values will normally be smaller than the strings. There is a small caveat here. If you are using a logger which can only uh, save strings, then you will need at runtime to convert the hash values back to strings. This, however, is really is easily mitigated uh, by obviously we're seen in, in we're, we are seen in macro world here. So you just inside your macro implementation, you do this just once. You cache every such occurrence. Since we are talking about hash strings, they uh, in this manner they the hash calculation will only be carried out the first time you produce that log. Impact on build times. Uh, is neg negligible, I haven't noticed any. Having said that, obviously there is a const expert hash function involved and if you were to pick an uh, expensive one, uh, anything could happen. Additional ideas for what may be done with this do on init utility. The first one, I'm not sure is the brightest one since I've come up with it. Uh, but also since it involves uh, production code. My idea was that uh, if you have a set of uh, API functions, you may be interested in simulating uh, default calls. I'm not sure that's such a compelling use case. I won't dwell on it too much. As I said, right now that would be production code. Perhaps that would be a good one for later. The second one, however, I'm, I believe you may find quite useful. It would allow you to integrate unit test code inside the actual function that's being tested, which is what I've shown here. Uh, the thing to bear in mind is that lines four and five here do not 
uh, involve any actual uh, recursion. Uh, although, of course, since in this case we are explicitly calling the actual function, it will be called, but that wouldn't constitute recursion. By now, uh, I hope that it's clear why. And, of course, unit test uh, would be if left out of uh, production code, so no issue there uh, either. So with that, I'd just like to thank several people which have helped me along the way. Uh, most of you, I believe, know in Bal Levy. There's also Daphna Mordechai in Israel. Uh, I am a first timer. And live long and prosper. Time for questions. I have two questions from online. Uh, Bear with me as I read the first one because it's a little long. Does this work with static linking? Static initialization tends to break when libraries are linked statically, at least it does on Linux. To be more specific, global static initialization breaks. Class and local static initialization still works. When our product uses static linking, so that should uh, answer it. I'm not sure we cover all, all cases, but in our case it works. So all of your examples, you use like a single string literal to mm -hmm. do the hashing and stuff. Um, I understand why maybe strings that you get at runtime wouldn't work because you don't have them available at compile time. Uh, but let's say you want to log something where you have multiple string literals that are available at compile time that aren't part of the same string. Uh, is it possible to modify this to do that? Yes, in our code, I am actually doing that. Uh, I'm, I'm taking the source location, which is made up of uh, three parts. I have the file name, uh, function name, and the uh, line number. And I have created a const expr uh, function. Uh, I mean, I, I took the, the hash function, which I showed you. I created the, the hash function basically includes a loop. It loops over all the characters. So I've provided an overload which has a, uh, an initializer list uh, parameter. And uh, I can pass several strings and do the hashing on all of them uh, at the same time. Cool, that, that makes sense, thank you for the talk. Mm -hmm. Another online question. If I have understood you correctly, the decoder will only work for static log messages. Is there a way to make this work for dynamically generated log messages or would that require a reversible approach such as encryption? Such as what? Encryption. Oh, well, by definition, this can only work with data that is available at compile time. The actual strings that in our uh, code uh, I'm encoding are uh, basically uh, for, for math strings. They include a lot of those percentage something and they allow me to ultimately um, produce a string which contains also runtime data. In, in the saved log, I, I, sa I store the, uh, the hashed format string, which includes the text of the log. And after that, I have a list of, uh, of runtime data with some uh, delimiters. Uh, that's a very interesting talk. Thank you. Okay. Uh, but uh, my question is, I'm I'm not one. I may be wrong. My, my uh, presumption may be wrong. But I believe there is a rule in C++ that uh, it's not required to initialize uh, global objects from a translation unit until you call some code from the translation unit. Have you ever encountered a problem with that? That the decoder basically doesn't doesn't call most of its translation units. Mm, not in our case. Uh, we have a cross-platform uh, project. I've checked it with Visual Studio on Windows and with, uh, it works with uh, Silang on uh, Linux and on Mac. Uh, okay. So I haven't checked all cases. Yeah. It's, no, no is a valid answer, I'm just kidding. It's, <laughs> it's basically of case of if it works in your case, you're set. It's, 
Right now, it's used for an internal tool. Makes sense. Thank you. Another online question. Is it possible to decode log messages on the fly as the program is running? What, what do you mean by that? Log messages on the fly. I, I believe you could have a decoder tool set up so as to um, receive uh, log messages at runtime. Those messages would be hashed. The decoder tool would be in possession of the uh, of the hashes, and I don't see any reason why that wouldn't be possible. Uh, hi, uh, this is almost a continuation of that previous question from mm -hmm. online. Uh, but have you considered uh, this might be um, another use case for this, where uh, we use it for internationalization, as uh, for strings to come in, we can now uh, encode them while well, having them in, in the source code, have them in uh, a log, have a creating file that has all the strings in it that then can be swapped out with different languages. Mm -hmm. And that would sort of have to, you'd have to then decode on the fly. So you would chain encoding, look up decoding, and you could potentially create a, uh, an internationalization tool. Okay, but mind you, you don't have access, the whole point is not having access to the original strings in the executable that is hashing them, that has the hashes. If you want to do something in a separate tool which does have access to those strings, then you can do all sorts of things, I suppose. Yes, but the idea that I'm trying to propose here is that um, you can now have these strings in, the, you can have the strings in the code straight up uh, in whatever language that you're coding in, in uh, English in my case. Uh, but then when we actually go to write the strings out to the user, it could be read from another log file. And you could actually have all of this in line and pulling it from another log file can now be from a different language. Because now you've auto-generated the hash values that can be then used for the lookup. I'm not sure. Let, let's discuss it. Another question, to add a comment to that point, yes, that's another use case. Again, really cool. Sorry, was there a question there? <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm not totally convinced that there is value of having log strings in the binary at all. Like if you can, if you can just figure out like what line of code through any possible mechanism, if you can just determine what line of code fired a log plus any runtime arguments that are attached, isn't that good enough? Like, can't you have code comments on that line saying what you are logging for? Yeah, but you want, I mean, you want to have an easy way to get logs from customer sites. How, how much work do you want to be doing when you get those logs back? You want to have a human readable log. How are you going to achieve that? Yeah, I guess that's fair. I was take, uh, I was saying that from the understanding that like I would just look at the code source, but maybe there's a scenario where someone else needs to read the log, like like we what you seem to be saying. So what's the problem that someone else would would decode the, the log with the decoder tool, and there you have it. Yeah, I think no, I think your answer does justify. That mm -hmm. scenario. Anyone else? Okay, I guess we're done then. Thank you.